Today I'm going to be walking through my full pedal board setup. There is definitely a lot going on here. I've been making a lot of changes recently, but just been having a lot of fun trying different things, just sort of exploring different sounds, and I'm really, really happy with where things have landed with this setup. So really excited to jump in, but first before we get into the sound samples, I want to talk about the board that I'm using. So this is the mono pedal board rail, the, the medium size. I have the small size board as well, and mono just makes some really, really high quality products. I am absolutely in love with their boards. I do love this size though. It's 24 inches by a little bit over 14 inches. And I just find that's able to fit everything on here while still remaining pretty lightweight. I've had a couple of smaller board builds where I've had to really cram everything on there and also turn pedals sideways and upside down. And while I do like a smaller footprint, I don't really love having to tweak my foot in kind of weird ways to hit all the pedals. So I do like with this build that pretty much everything is just straight up and down, really, really easy access to all the buttons and everything like that. This board also does come with an amazing case. I absolutely love this thing. It is a soft case, but it's got a pocket on the inside. But the thing that I like about this is that despite being a soft case, it's really, really durable and makes traveling with this board really, really safe and secure and light as well. And underneath the board, everything is powered by this mono large power supply. And these power supplies are really, really great as well. I was using the Strymon Zuma for a while. Nothing wrong with that, it's a perfectly great power supply, but I really wanted to try this because of how lightweight it is and also how thin it is. So you can even just get an idea here. I've got it mounted underneath in that really skinny slot right there. So it powers everything just great. I haven't really noticed any noise or feedback or anything like that. So highly, highly recommend these mono power supplies. I also have this Pinstripe Pedals multi-buffer mounted underneath as well. This is actually the start of my signal chain. I'm gonna to touch on this a little bit more here in a second, but you've probably noticed I don't have any amp modelers or anything on the board in its current state. And that is because everything is going into a separate Tonex board. So I moved over to the dual Tonex setup a few months ago. I'd been using the Iridium forever, for years and years, pretty much when it first came out. I used that for a long time. Most of the videos on the channel are using the Strymon Iridium. And then I tried a dual Iridium setup for a little while and then figured I may as well try these out and I haven't looked back. Super, super great, big, big fan of these. I'll also touch a little bit more on how I get these things dialed in and the captures that I used and all of that uh, here in a little bit. But for the actual board that I'm using, this is the Pedal Train Nano Plus. It's just big enough, you can see, to fit the two Tone X's as well as the Pinstripe Pedals Daiso Plus at the very, very end of the chain. And underneath this board, I am running another mono power supply. This is the medium size. This just gives me enough juice to power these guys, and I've got a couple extra outputs just in case I need them. But the cool thing about the mono power supplies is that they are modular and you can actually link them together. So instead of needing to take up two wall outputs by plugging in both of these guys, you can just link the two power supplies on the two boards together. And with just one wall output, I can plug it in and it powers up both boards. Really, really convenient, really, really cool. So again, the mono stuff is just top tier. I'm also using these EBS flat cables. These are really, really great. Uh, I've got a couple of different cables, but for the most part, the whole board is powered with these guys for the price, but also for how flat these are. These are awesome, highly recommend. I'll have these linked as well as kind of everything else I'm gonna talk about today, linked down in the description. Uh, but if you got any questions, anything with this, just let me know. Also, everything you're gonna hear today is gonna be through this Citizen Guitars C2. I just got this recently and I'm absolutely in love. It's got Lambertone Crema pickups. I finally understand the hype. These are really, really great. And don't worry, I still have the blue telly. That's not going anywhere. But for today, like I said, we're gonna be playing through this. All right, so let's jump into the signal chain. Like I mentioned earlier, I am going into the Pinstripe Pedals multi-buffer first. And the reason that I got this is I feel like I was just losing a little bit of my signal clarity. I think just with the amount of cables that I have in my signal chain, the more pedals that I was adding in, I think I was just finding my tone was a little bit more dull. And I definitely noticed a big difference when I would just plug it in straight into the tone X's as opposed to at the beginning of my signal chain. So 
I knew I wanted to get the multi buffer because there are some really cool functions on there. But Charlie from Pinstripe Pedals just crushed it with this thing. It's so, so good. As soon as I added it to my board, I just feel like it just adds another level of clarity and strength to my signal. It just sounds really full and clear now. If you're familiar with his Daiso Plus, you're probably familiar with the Jensen transformers that are in that. Those are also in this multi buffer. So like I said, it just adds a lot of clarity. But what's cool about this multi buffer is it actually has two outputs outputs on it. So one of my other outputs actually just goes straight into my tuner. So I don't have to have that going out of my volume pedal. I suspect that was maybe part of the reason for why I was getting a little bit of signal loss. So I just have the tuner going out of the second output on here, which means I can just keep it on all the time and I don't need to worry about any sort of signal loss or anything like that. So huge part of the pedal board makes a big, big difference. Huge fan of it. So out of the multi buffer, I go into my compressor. I'm using the Barber Electronics Tone Press. I used the Deep Six for a while and loved it. And I still, it's a great pedal. I still have mine, big fan of that. Um, but I wanted to move to this Tone Press because I really do like to dial in a good amount of compression. And I felt like with the Deep Six, I was just losing something with it. I think my tone sounded just a little bit more dull. And so I found with the tone press, I feel like it retains a lot of the character and sparkle, and it still sounds really lively, even when you do have a lot of compression blended into it. So I do run this on all the time. I don't ever turn it off. I'm a really big fan of just having this as a part of my core tone. It definitely rounds things out and it adds a good bit of sustain, which is really, really helpful. So I'm just gonna play this with a little bit of reverb coming from the chroma console. And then I'll add on some more wet effects just so you can hear that sustain in action. <laughs> So like I said, definitely a good amount of compression blended in on this, but uh, really that sustain and kind of the roundness that it adds to the signal, which really balances things out in a really nice way. So out of the compressor, I go into my octave pedal. This is the Pitchfork by Electro Harmonics. And I love this pedal. And it's funny because I'm not really a huge fan of the octave effect, but this has so much versatility built into it. You can use it like a regular octave pedal. It's even got a detune function, which is almost kind of like a really intense chorus type of sound, but probably my favorite way to use this is using the latch function. So basically what you can do is press that button right there. And then you'll see once I, once I engage the pedal and turn it on and hold it, it'll engage. But then once I let go, it'll disengage. So it's almost like using an expression pedal to an extent, but it's a really cool way to sort of shoot up or down to any interval you want. So, you know, I'll typically set this to maybe a fourth or a fifth or something like that. And it just sort of adds this kind of synthy, cool sound that's different than just sliding up. Uh, it's pretty unnecessary <laughs> to be honest, but uh, just sort of adds an extra level of tonal difference, I guess, that, that just sounds really, really cool. So big fan of that. So I'll show you how I would dial this in just for kind of a regular octave effect. And then I'll show you that latch function as well. <laughs> I want to mention too that this is so early in my chain. I like to have this before my drive pedals because I have found that this can be a little bit piercing on the ears. I wish there was a, a tone knob or something to dial down some of those highs. 
So I have found that running it earlier can help because having your drives stacked on top of this can help just sort of mitigate some of that harshness. So that's why I have this pretty early on in my signal chain. So going out of the pitchfork, I go into the final piece of kind of completing my core tone. I'm going into the 1981 Inventions LVL, which is awesome. I'm a really, really big fan of this. I'm basically using this as kind of like a tone sweetener, I guess you would say. Uh, it's just adding a teeny bit of volume, a really small amount of gain. And, you know, I've kind of just been playing with dirtier amps lately, you know, a, a dirtier core tone. And so I kind of use this as an always on sort of a thing. Um, I just feel like it makes everything sound better. Uh, I love having this before my whole drive section. Um, when I don't have it on, I just feel like I'm, I'm missing it. It's just missing something. I feel like it just sort of adds this nice fullness, uh, this really nice breakup, kind of pre ampy type of thing. So I'll show you again, just sort of like my clean tone, and then I'll add this on so you can hear the difference between the two. <laughs> definitely pretty dirty especially when I dig in but it's great because you know if you flip to the middle pickup and just sort of back off on your picking dynamics it does clean up just enough where it's got just a little bit of that breakup kind of a little bit of that sizzle where it's not just going to sound thin and just sort of disappear in the mix so that's why I like having this as just sort of an always on sort of thing because it's so usable I feel like in the past you know my clean tone wasn't ever usable it just sounded too thin and you know i would always play with some sort of a drive pedal or something on but i never would just use my clean tone so having the compressor with the lvl here is a really usable kind of core tone i can have this on all the time and if i need anything more i can add on one of my overdrive pedals and you know maybe there's a time where i do need something a little bit less i can always just turn it off and i'm pretty happy with sort of my standard clean tone. So out of the LVL, I go into the Limelight by Electronic Audio Experiments. And this is a relatively new pedal that I've been playing with. And it's really, really cool. So it is a two in one. The left side is kind of like a blues breaker on steroids. I've realized with this, there is so much volume and gain on tap. I mean, you can probably see right now, I've got the gain pretty much at zero and just pushing some volume into this. It just sounds huge. So I'll talk about the left side in a minute, but I wanna start with the boost on the right side of this. So this is a independent boost. You don't have to have the left side engaged in order to use it. So I actually like to use this boost kind of like my first stage overdrive. I know I have the LVL on, it's kind of an always on thing, but this I'm treating this more like my first stage. So it's just gonna give me a little bit more of kind of what I already have, but it just adds a little bit of sparkle. It sounds really, really good. I wanted to mention too that I actually am running the Limelight and the LVL both at 18 volts. I noticed a little difference. I didn't really notice a, a huge difference, but it did add just a little bit more openness, a little bit more clean headroom. It just feels a little bit more solid. So especially as we're introducing more gain, I just really wanted to make sure that that clarity was still there and everything just still felt intact. So let's start with the clean boost first and then we'll jump into the left side after that. <laughs>
So like I said, it's just a little volume increase. We're getting a little bit more gain. Um, there's some nice sparkle there with that too, but the left side has some cool stuff going on. So there's this toggle switch that can help this cut a little bit of the bass and cut through the mix a little bit better. So basically I've got it in the down position, but the middle position is sort of just a flat response. I don't think it's really cutting very much bass at all. The, the bottom toggle where I have it right now is cutting a little bit more bass. So I actually, I am using this as a little bit more of kind of my punch through the mix type of pedal. Um, you know, we'll, we'll touch on the Benson here in a little bit and how I'm using that differently than this pedal. But this is something that's nice, you know, maybe if I'm playing something with a lot of lower notes, but I still want to punch through, um, it just cuts it in a really nice way where it doesn't sound too shrill or too harsh, but it does just focus things uh, a little bit more. So I do love that down toggle. And then you can flip the, the toggle all the way up, which cuts even more bass and it does seem to get even more focused, but uh, it wasn't really my favorite. I, I really like kind of this down toggle position the most. So here's what that sounds like. <laughs> So there's a little bit more to unpack with the boost here, but before we do that, I do want to touch on the Benson preamp, which is next in the chain. I'm so glad to have this back on my board. I actually had benched this to use the JHS Kilt version two for a little while, and I still have it. It's great. I may substitute this on and off here and there, but the Benson really is, I think, honestly, I think it's my all time favorite overdrive. It just has so much character to it. I love how full and, and huge it sounds, uh, but it also doesn't get lost. So I'm using this as a very different flavor compared to the left side of the limelight because as that was cutting a lot of the bass, the Benson retains a lot of that bass. So, you know, if I'm gonna be doing more like single note lead lines, or if I just wanna really sound huge, I'm gonna add the Benson on. I do have a little bit more gain dialed into this as well. So this is sort of like my lead go-to. I just want to sound really full, you know, maybe there's a driving lead line or something like that. Uh, then I'm going to hit the, the Benson. <laughs> So you can hear it definitely fills a bit of a different sonic space compared to the limelight, but that's kind of why I wanted to have the two on here. I know we've got a couple boosts, a couple things uh, happening here, but as far as kind of my main gain stages that I'm going to be adding in, you know, having the, the option to either cut some of those highs or really fill in some more space with something like the Benson uh, is really great. I, I'm finding that the two are definitely kind of complementing each other pretty well. So out of the Benson, I go into this Tone Ranger Audio Germanium Boost, which is absolutely insane. It's so, so good. But I also had mentioned a second ago that I wanted to unpack the boost in the limelight a little bit more as well. And so I've been playing around with this approach right now where I'm sort of sandwiching my drives in between the boost pedals. So, you know, really when we think about my drive section, I'm starting with the boost and the limelight, and then I'm going into the drive side of the limelight, the Benson, and then finishing my drive chain with this Germanium boost from Tone Ranger Audio. So this approach was kind of born after playing with the Kilt version two for a little while, and it has that red remote feature, which is really, really cool. You can basically just hit a button and you sort of get 
a little bit of extra gain baked into your existing signal. So I wanted to play with having a boost at the beginning of the drive chain so that if I'm using the limelight, for example, and I hit that boost, it's going to be boosting into that pedal. But the same thing could be done with the Benson as well. If I have the Benson on and I want just a little bit more gain, I can hit the boost of the limelight that's before everything to just add a little bit more gain. But in the case where I may want some more volume and I wanna push that volume into the amps or into the tone X's, I have this Germanium boost at the very end of the chain too. So it's kind of a cool way where I could get some flexibility around how much gain I want playing around with that boost earlier on. And then once I'm ready to kind of push some more volume for a lead line or something like that, I've got this Germanium boost at the very end. So I'll just play through a couple of variations of what those boosts sound like. So out of my drive section, I go into this volume pedal. This is uh, one of the Dunlop minis. I forget exactly what the model is, uh, but it's fine. You know, really there isn't much to say about this. Uh, the footprint is okay. Honestly, I think at some point I may try to go a little bit bigger because it's just a small-ish footprint for right now, but it gets the job done. You know, I can definitely swell with it. And like I mentioned earlier, I did take out the uh, the tuner out function because I just felt like I was getting a little bit of tone suck with that. So it's fine. Like I said, gets the job done. So now we're going to get into the good stuff. We're going to get into the Chroma Console, the Strymon Timeline, and then the Strymon Big Sky as well. But I think it'd actually be important before going too deep into those to first touch on the Morningstar MC6 Pro. This is the MIDI controller that I'm using to really pretty heavily control all three of those pedals. So I do have a full dedicated video on just sort of my workflow using MIDI. I'm gonna link that right up here. Feel free to check it out if you want, but there are some things that I've changed since filming that video. The concept is pretty much the same. So I'm not gonna go too deep into everything here because it could be a much, much longer video if that were the case. But basically here on the left side, I have either more reverb or less reverb. Uh, what this is basically doing is this is just scrolling through all of my Big Sky presets. So it makes it really, really easy. You know, if I click up here, you'll see this scrolling through my Big Sky presets. So as I'm scrolling through, if I want a little bit more, I can just bank up. If I want a little bit less, I could just use this less verb button and it scrolls down through all of these. And the cool thing is I basically have four different flavors of reverb presets. I have Bloom, which is kind of the driest, a couple cloud presets, and then I have a Plate preset, which is at the very end here. So Plate is definitely the most kind of wet, the most ambient that I have. And then as I keep scrolling through it, it'll cycle right back to Bloom. So it's really nice. It's a really easy way just to kind of scroll up and down and quickly access whatever sounds I might need in a given moment. Uh, here on the bottom, I've got this timeline button. So you'll see as I scroll through this. Similarly, it's kind of like a carousel. Um, I've got six timeline settings saved here. These are kind of just my standard workhorse timeline delays. There's six of them. All six are tape. Uh, basically what they are is, is a low, medium, high for an eighth subdivision, and then a low, medium, high for a dotted eighth subdivision. So with reverb, I figured one button is fine because I don't really change my standard delay sounds all too often. But you're probably noticing as I scroll through these, it's staying on the A button here on the timeline. And so the reason for that is I like to have the B side freed up to be anything else, any sort of like an ambient type of sound. You'll see here I've got the chill preset. This is kind of like an octave shimmery type of sound that's using the ice delay. So it's nice because, you know, really depending on what sound I might need, if I need a lighter or a heavier delay sound, I can just select whichever one I kind of want to be my home base. And then I can program whatever the B side is 
to be, you know, really whatever type of sound I wanna pair with that. So I've also got this vibe button here on the top right. This is basically my go-to vibrato sound. I do tend to use vibrato quite a bit, so I liked having it just as a easy access, quick button I can hit, and that triggers the chroma console to pull up one of my vibrato presets. So that one's pretty easy, just toggles on and off. This BPM set is pretty interesting. I go way more into depth in my other video about this, but basically this takes me to a whole nother page where I can pre-program different song BPMs. So like usually at my church, we'll play just four songs. So you can see here, I've got four songs with their BPMs already preset. And then you can see once I trigger one, you know, this is 78 BPM. Let's say we are gonna do the joy next. Then it'll trigger 132 BPM. So it's nice because really, you know, you can pre-program these BPMs, which is nice for those quick switches in between songs. But I do like to keep things pretty flexible. So, you know, I've got this tap tempo button here on the top right. So let's say for example, maybe we don't have a pre-programmed BPM or we're doing something spontaneous and I just need to tap it in. I could just start tapping. And then you can see here, you know, it's, it's just tapped in 79 BPM. So Nice and flexible that way. If we also are maybe going to do a new song or change things up, but I know what the BPM is gonna be, I can actually hold down this tap tempo button and then dial in my own BPM here. Let's just say it's 100 BPM. Uh, what I can do is I can click save and exit and it's gonna start sending 100 BPM. So super flexible with uh, sending MIDI clock, which is really, really nice. And it does send MIDI clock to the timeline as well as the Chroma console. So it's definitely cool. There are some delays and stuff uh, in the Chroma console, which sending MIDI clock to both that and the timeline just sort of keeps everything on the same page. So really, really cool. Love that function. So if we go back to kind of our home page, the last button here is Chroma. And so this is just the Chroma console. I've got a, a couple more presets here, all kinds of different sounds. I've got uh, a chorus. Uh, fuzz, some, some really, really cool stuff here. So this may actually be a good area to kind of spend a little bit more time and just kind of walk through how I'm using the Chroma console in general. So the Chroma console is absolutely crazy. <laughs> it has been really, really fun and actually kind of a challenge to just explore this thing and try to learn everything that this can do. I mean, there's so many options. I mean, it does everything from drives to fuzz to delays and reverbs, modulation effects like pitch, vibrato, phaser, tremolo, uh, to a lot of kind of cool textury, ambient, lo-fi types of sounds. I mean, it does so, so much. So I still feel like I've just scratched the surface, but I have spent a good amount of time with it and dialed in a couple presets that just sort of serve different purposes. So let's walk through a couple of those. Like you saw on the homepage on the Morningstar, I've got this vibe setting. This is just sort of like a classic, uh, pretty subtle vibrato that I like to have on. So here's what that sounds like. So I love using that vibrato sound, but if I want something that's maybe a little bit more lo-fi, something that's a little bit more buried in the mix, I do have this lo-fi setting that I've saved that's basically the same sound, but I'm using the filter control to remove some of the highs. So it kind of gets that lo-fi feel to it. So here's what that sounds like. I also have a chorus effect dialed in right now. This one was a little bit trickier to get because there actually isn't a chorus module on here. So I was kind of just messing around with different pitch effects to find something that had some chorusing to it. So this is what that sounds like. I 
as I mentioned too, there are some really great drives. For them being digital, I'm really surprised how great some of the, the drive sounds are in this thing. Uh, but I did save a, a fuzz sound. I don't use fuzz often, uh, at least for, for worship music, but this was pretty fun to just have on hand just in case if I need it. <laughs> I also have this collage sound. This one is pretty crazy. <laughs> this is one that I probably would use with a ton of reverb, maybe swells. Uh, this is like a very ambient option uh, that has some pretty cool pitch effects going on. I actually use the gesture control if you're familiar with that with the Chrome console. Basically, you can record any knob movements. So what I'm doing with this is I'm using the collage sound on here, which kind of has this broken up delay type of thing that chops up your signal and spits it back out in different octave intervals. But I'm also changing the time so that it's gonna sort of shoot up and shoot down different octaves, uh, kind of at different intervals. So pretty crazy sound, but it's a lot of fun. And the last preset that at least I have saved here on the MC6 Pro is this analog delay. So like I mentioned a little bit ago, I am sending this MIDI clock to the Chroma console as well as the timeline. So this is actually gonna give me a dual delay option if I want it. So, you know, usually I have the timeline on all the time and I do tend to use the dotted eighth more often than not. So I have this analog preset from the Chroma console set to an analog delay, but it's set to an eighth delay. So really whenever I want, I can engage this and then have a nice dual delay where uh, this will play together well with the timeline and do sort of an, an eighth into a dotted eighth dual delay thing. So I've dialed in a lot of modulation and a pretty different type of sound than my kind of classic tape sound. So it does get some pretty cool ambience some pretty cool movement to it. So here's what that sounds like. Said, there's just a crazy amount of sounds in the chroma console that is barely scratching the surface on the amount of stuff that's in here so that's just kind of how i'm using it right now it's more of just uh something to just explore different types of sounds just having a lot of fun with that uh, but it's also covering some kind of staple modulation stuff too like some of the vibrato sounds uh, the dual delay like i said is, is i think my favorite uh, on here so very, very cool kind of Swiss Army knife. But really, you know, from there, this goes into the Strymons. This goes into the Strymon timeline and the Big Sky. Honestly, I've, I've kind of been using them this whole uh, pedal board walkthrough so far. So I don't think I need to spend too much time on these. But basically, you know, just to kind of walk through my workflow, uh, really with both of them, I like to do really simple, just small, medium, large 
presets. So for the timeline, I'll just show you what each of these sounds like. And then I'll also show uh, some of the more kind of fun delays that I have too. I've got a couple other fun options as well that I like to pair with these. So here's what these sound like. And then for the big sky, it's pretty much the same workflow. Like I said, I like to do just a small, medium, large, but then having different flavors of reverb, you know, different amounts of decay, different amounts of mix, depending on what the song might call for, but also just what's inspiring to me in the moment. So here's just a quick demo of what one of these banks sounds like. <laughs> to mention too i do have all of my presets available for the timeline and the big sky so if you want to download these for yourself go ahead and check out the description i'll have a link there and you can check them out there but really from here i go out of the big sky into the two tone x's and right now there are so many different captures that i am just swapping around and just having a lot of fun trying a lot of different stuff as you can see that's kind of the theme for this pedal board walkthrough uh, really just having a, a lot of fun exploring different sounds and just trying things so for right now i think my favorites are these tone shepherd uh, it's an ac30 on the left and then his pro sonic on the right um, you know, if you don't know Devin, go check him out. He's got some amazing stuff over at the Tone Shepherd. Um, great, great YouTube videos, but he's just an awesome guy as well. So um, if you're looking for some Tonex captures, definitely check out his stuff. They're top notch. They're, they sound awesome. So I'm using his clean captures of both, but I have gained them up a little bit. Like I said, towards the beginning, I've kind of been playing around with a bit of a dirtier core sound. So I have gain them up a bit so they've got just a little bit of character. They're not too sterile um, by themselves. But again, I am adding things in like the LVL. But for the most part, I haven't really touched anything EQ wise with these. I I've gained it up a little bit. Like I said, I added just a, a little bit of bass and uh, I think I maybe I turned the treble down just a hair as well. But for the most part, uh, these are pretty much stock. So yeah, he, he knocked it out of the park with these captures. But really, really big fan of these. I'm definitely gonna just keep trying different captures and, and trying different things out. But really from here, I go into the Pinstripe Pedals Daiso Plus. I've had this thing for years at this point and man, I could not say enough good things about it. I mean, this has gotta be one of the best investments I've made in my pedal board. Um, I, I play a lot at different churches. You never really know what type of setup you may be walking into. So this has just been a really great consistency thing for me. Uh, I feel like my tone at home sounds the same at church. No matter what venue I'm stepping into, I just have a lot of confidence that my tone is going to just sound as it should. So that in itself is a huge reason to have one of these on your board, but it also does have some helpful things too. It's got a ground lift to eliminate if you got any hum, any stage noise, anything like that is helpful. But it also has the phase reverse. So maybe if you are using like two tone X's, two iridiums, and those two amp captures are out of phase with one another, you can just flip that switch 
right here on the Daiso Plus. Super, super handy. Plus, Charlie from Pinstripe Pedals is just the nicest guy ever, so I'm always going to talk him up. Uh, for what it's worth, too, this is not sponsored. I've paid for both Multibuffer and the Daiso Plus with my own money, um, just shouting him out because he's, he's just an awesome, awesome guy. Now, this was a pretty high-level walkthrough of this pedal board, but if you're wanting to dial in these types of tones that you heard today into your own rig and just get a great worship guitar tone, I'm going to have a video linked right up here walking you through exactly how to do that. So go ahead and check that out, and I will see you in the next one.